Some of you have been with us for the other sessions. Some of you, maybe this is the first time you've been attending one of these sessions. Uh, regardless, we're happy to see you here. We will drop in the chat some of the other resources provided by the SBI, by the FAST Center of Illinois. Um, so I was just going to say, Eric, those are great questions that may be better suited in a one-on-one -on -one opportunity to meet with Roland. Um, as well as um, we have several other experts, uh, SBIR experts who are available to you at free of charge, um, thanks to the support that we have from the SBA to run the FAST Center. Uh, so I am very um, happy. I, have, I was just trying to think, Roland, how long I've worked with you. It's been many, many years. So oh, we heavens, are very, yes, our kids were all small. <laughs> <laughs> very lucky to have such expertise in our backyard. Um, and I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Laura Blyle. I am the Director of External Engagement here at the University of Illinois Research Park. We are the home of the FAST Center of Illinois. We may be located in Champaign. However, we do provide services and resources to entrepreneurs across the state of Illinois. As I mentioned though, Roland happens to be literally up the street from me right now, I believe, probably could walk to you in about 15 minutes. Um, uh, so we are lucky to have such great resources in our own backyard, although we do have uh, SBIR experts around the state as well, who have a variety of areas of expertise considering different agencies, as well as things like budgets. So that's why we're here today. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Roland Garten to discuss SBIR budgets and other details. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah, glad to have everybody uh, joining in. As you have questions, feel free to pop them into the chat. My setup here allows me to see the chat, but it's really small the way that it shows up on my system. So I might not see every question, but uh, Kathy and Laura will monitor the chat. They'll add things in. But you know, please do feel free to raise your hand electronically or uh, ask questions in the chat as we go along. I will stop periodically to entertain questions so you can be formulating them as I talk. There will be specific opportunities for asking, but if you have questions, pop them into the chat and we'll make sure and get to them sooner or later. Most of the session today is gonna be on budgets, but not all of it. I will spend a little bit of time talking about the general timeline of proposal development and what you can expect when you should start working on certain aspects of it. And I'll spend a little bit of time on formatting and graphics. Having a presentation that a reviewer can look at and understand at a glance is critical and there are some tips and techniques I can present to you to help ease some of that. I've got whole sessions on it, but there are a few key points I couldn't get to now. But for now, to begin with the budget. Now, what I'm gonna talk about is common questions that come up. This is not a comprehensive listing of all the areas of the budget. It's a listing or it's a discussion of where I tend to get the most questions. And so I will try to anticipate your questions and respond to them. I will also talk mostly about NSF and NIH, but if you've got other agencies, feel free to ask about the other agencies. The, the budget is one of the most difficult sections that people tend to wrangle with. And I've got a few key points that I would make, like to make right off the bat. Number one, read the guidelines. Every agency is different. Everybody has a different set of guidelines. And in fact, you've got more than one set of guidelines. You usually have two sets of guidelines. NIH, for example, has a solicitation, which is guidelines about the particular SBIR opportunity. And they have got more details about what to put in the forms online. That's in a separate document called an application guide. So they've got four different solicitations. Make sure you get the right one if you're choosing the generic grant SBIR. If you have a more specific topic to NIH, they have a contract version of the SBIR program that comes out every October. And this has its own solicitation. So you've got five solicitations to choose from with SBIR and the application guide. With NSF, for example, you've got two different solicitations to choose from. There's a phase one or a phase two. Phase one is both SBIR and STTR. Their phase two solicitation also covers both, but two solicitations. And they've got a separate document called a proposal and a board policies and procedures guide, the PAPPG. It's the PAPPG that tells you the page limit, the, what to put in the margins, what not to put in the margins, what to, how to number pages, um, 
font size, those kinds of restrictions. So make sure and read these. And your other agencies will have their own set of guidelines. And they vary not only by agency, but from year to year. Each year, I have to review the guidelines because there's something new. There's some new twist that, that they haven't happened before. NIH, for example, recently allowed uh, uh, up their, their minimum font size from 10 points to 11 points. And now your NIH proposals all have to be minimum 11 points, no matter what font you use. I'm painfully aware of this because one of my clients just got rejected by NIH because their font size was too small. Surprisingly, the NIH machinery did not detect that the font size was too small. So when they submitted it, the checking machinery at NIH said, okay, go ahead and submit. But then later on they reviewed and they said, this looks a little small. Yeah, it is a little small. We're gonna reject the proposal. And there's nothing they can do now except wait until the next time and resubmit. You have to pay attention to these. You will get rejected if you don't meet these picky you and little um, uh, guidelines and requirements. A couple other takeaways. This is, you'll hear me talk about this a lot. The overriding goal of your budget is realism. You don't want to promise too much. Uh, you don't want to ask for more dollars and resources that you need, and you don't want to ask for uh, too fewer dollars and resources that you need the budget has to be appropriate to the task as you propose it. Now, sometimes you'll have an SBIR money coming in that's a source of funds among other source of funds. And the whole project is a little bigger than the SBIR program. You can go ahead and mention that in the budget guidelines. If in fact you're proposing to do work and it's gonna be funded from investment money or other sources, you can say that uh, in the budget description, the budget narrative, but you don't have, there's no requirement for matching money. You don't have to do that. But just make sure that what you propose in, in your proposal to the agency matches the resources that you have to accomplish that goals. Realism is critical. Another big takeaway, don't lose money. The federal government really did not set up the SBIR program for businesses to lose money on the project and then recoup it later on. They want the businesses to not to lose money on the particular technical effort that's funded by SBIR. So don't be a good guy and undercut your, your fee structure, for example, and I'll talk about those later. Be realistic, um, put in what you need to make the money, to make the project work. Now, on the don't lose money front, there are different kinds of, of expenses that you can spend on a project. You have direct expenses that is that are dollars spent specifically on the effort of the project. That's travel associated with the project, materials and supplies, personnel is usually the biggest portion of the budget, subcontractor costs. These are costs for people working directly on the project. In addition, the federal government realizes, well, you have costs of running the company that you can't allocate to any one project. The costs of telephone, the costs of rent, the costs of time spent in running the company, those are indirect costs. And so the government allows you to request money for indirect costs in addition to the direct costs when you submit the proposal. The ward pays for both of them. And they, they allow you to calculate the indirect costs just as a percentage of the direct costs. There are different kinds of indirect costs. Uh, you, can, you can establish many, many different kinds and DOD contractors with a lot of experience in big companies tend to have multiple indirect rate cost pools. But the main three that I see in the clients and that are starting up with the SBR program are fringe benefits. These are costs directly associated with labor, payroll taxes, health insurance, retirement plans, vacation, time off. Those are directly associated with later's, uh, labor. That is a potential indirect cost. There are general and administrative costs. I mentioned these already, phone, utilities, time spent running the company, secretarial support, uh, rent. And you can assess a fee and a profit for an SBIR proposal. This is not technically an indirect cost. It is just fee and profit that's available to you. All of your costs, direct and indirect, have to fit within the total funding limit. So if you're writing an NSF proposal phase one and you have a $256,000 limit, all these costs have to be under that $256,000. Let's look at a couple of simple examples of how to allocate direct indirect costs. Here's one example uh, that's the simplest and it is a single tier cost element. 
in this cost element, all the indirect costs are applied to staff only. Now, in these examples, I've eliminated uh, equipment, I've eliminated subcontracts just to show you the simple, uh, the, the way that it costs work. So in this one, you might have staff costs of close to 150,000. Uh, you might have some other direct costs. So you've got total direct costs of 164,000. And then you take some kind of a GNA rate that includes both fringe and your GNA expenses. You apply that to labor only and you get a total indirect and direct of 239,000. You can add a 7% fee and that comes up to 256,000. This is the rate structure that's favored by NSF. They like this approach. You can submit a fringe benefit approach to them if you want to, but this is a very simple approach. And I H, I usually see a two tier model in which fringe benefits are applied to labor and then GNA is applied to the total of labor and fringe benefits. So running through the scenario, you've got about $130,000 of staff costs. You've got fringe benefits, we're saying it's 25,000. You've got other direct costs and you get a total of 170,000 in total direct costs. Then 40% of this figure, 170,000 is 68,000. You can apply the 68,000, the GNA costs to both. That's the 170,000, you get 239,000 in expenses, uh, total direct and indirect. You can apply a fee of 7% and you get a total of 256,000. Roland, you had a question in the chat. Is the average 7%? That is, I think, the de facto fee, but is not your overhead rate. Maybe you can clarify the 7%. Right. The fee is profit only. It is not a direct or indirect rate. And the 7% is the maximum allowed on most SBIR phase one proposals. You can go less than that, but you can't go more than that on most proposals, with some exceptions. <coughs> The 7% fee is a profit that you can choose to use however you want. You can go to the Bahamas and travel if you want. Uh, you can take a vacation if you want. You can spend extra money and give a really nice fee, you know, a bonus to the consultant like me if you want. Um, so you can use that however you want. There are no restrictions. Fringe benefits have to be applied to labor. GNA costs have to be applied to whatever the base is, but the GNA costs can include only the, the indirect expenses that are allowed by the government. Now, there's always a question about what rate to use. And there are three ways to determine what rate to use. Companies with a history and uh, who have gone through a negotiated rate process can have a negotiated rate agreement. Most of you will not have a NICRA. Most of you will not be able to do this. If you do, great, you can just use that rate if you've already negotiated one. Most of you will, will not have done that. Some of the agencies offer you a safe rate. With NIH, the safe rate is 40%. They say, as long as you use a, a GNA rate of 40%, we won't question it. You can just use the GNA rate of 40%. And this is appropriate, especially if you're a new startup company and don't have a history. You don't have a basis for justifying a rate structure. With NSF, the rate structure is 50%. That 50%, of course, includes both fringe and GNA rates. USDA has a de minimis rate of 10%. Unless you justify a higher rate, you have to go with 10% with USDA. And the various agencies will have different amounts. Or, so you can use the safe rates or you can prepare to negotiate a rate prior to award. If you have some basis for justifying a rate that's different than the safe rates or higher than the safe rates, you can be prepared to negotiate that. And at some point before you're actually getting the award, you will be asked to supply those numbers, but you don't have to supply them with the budget. All right, uh, a word on fee here. <clears throat> the fee applies, as, I, as you saw in the illustrations, to both direct and indirect expenses. Um, it has to be included in the budget cap, which I mentioned. Uh, NSF just recently raised their allowable fee to 10% on a phase two NSF. So that has gone up. NASA also allows 10% in sub some situations. So phase two, you can you can do, you do even more with the profit. You do not get any points for going low. If you say, well, I'm going to impress the judges and request only a 2% fee so that they'll smile on me since I'm such a good guy, uh, that doesn't matter. It's not part of your evaluation criteria. 
So there's really no evaluation benefit to going low. Now, sometimes if your 7% fee ends up with a figure of $257,000 rather than 256, you can lower the fee to like 6.9% just to make sure you're under the cap. I see that a lot. That's a nice way to adjust to make sure within the cap. But in general, no particular benefit to going low. All right. So far, budgets, fees. I'm going to pause and see if there are any questions at this point. And let's see. Uh, I'm looking through the chat myself. We have a free expert consulting available to help you. All right, I'm not seeing any uh, quick questions. Uh, oh, somebody asked 7% is the air. Oh, I answered that question already. Okay, any other questions? I'll just pause for a moment and see if there are any others. We did have one more. We are considering a USDA application. I see your note except with USDA. Right, USDA has that de minimis rate of 10%. So unless you can justify a higher rate with some data and some bookkeeping financial reports, you have to do the 10% rate for USDA. And that's overhead, not the fee. The 10%, yes, is, wait, a 10, 10% is the overhead, correct. Good clarification. I think that's true for university researchers too, that they're one of the lowest overhead rates allowed. Wow. So maybe if you're used to working with USDA, that won't seem shocking. All right, well, keep the questions coming. I'll continue. Uh, a couple other areas where I usually get questions. One is participant uh, training and support costs. Just skip them. They're not allowed in a phase one proposal. A participant support cost example would be if you have a pizza party in order to, for people to come in and try and use your product and get feedback on your product and you wanted to charge the pizza to the grant, that pizza would not be allowable, nor the soft drinks that go with it. The people that you can pay though are direct employees of the company, which brings us to the personnel section. And so you can have two different kinds of personnel, senior and other personnel, and all of the SBIR agencies have this breakout. Senior personnel are those who contribute substantive intellectual contributions to the product, the brain power. These are the ones who influence the research and development. They're not just hired work, but they actually think through how the project's gonna work. They have something to say about the research and development. They're guiding it. These are your senior personnel. They must be named in the proposal and each one of them will have to submit a bio sketch. They do not need letters of support. You can have other personnel to be determined. You can say, okay, we're going to hire a so software engineer. We're going to hire uh, some kind of a lab tech. You can say that we're gonna hire them. And then in the justification for your budget, you describe what their role is, what they're gonna do, but you don't have to name them. You don't have to give their bio sketches. Eric, I'll answer one of your questions now. And that's uh, the, as a reminder, and I, I didn't mention this because it was mentioned in an earlier session, but the, on an SBIR phase one proposal, the small business that's making, that's applying for the proposal has to do at least two thirds of the worth work measured by the budget. And though that two thirds of the work has to include your other direct costs, your materials and supplies, and it has to include personnel. And so you want to have personnel working for you that mount to at least two thirds of the work when added to the, um, the other direct costs, two thirds. Only one third can be subcontracted and let out to other people. And those other people could be consultants or they could be subcontractors. A consultant is an individual who helps out with the project. Usually they've got some kind of an intellectual contribution. They might not own any IP, but they're advisors. They guide the process. They give you good input on what you're gonna do with research and development. They're individuals with brain power they have to submit a bio sketch and you have to watch out with NSF. There's a maximum of $1,000 a day that you can reimburse a consultant. That comes to $125 an hour, which is a lot less than consultants often make in high tech industries. And so if you're using a consultant with NSF, you have to find one who's willing to work for a little bit less than their typical rate, the $125 an hour. NIH doesn't have that requirement. The other agencies don't necessarily have the requirement. USDA does. USDA requirement is lower. It's $625 a day. A subcontract is an organization 
that contributes to the intellectual development of the project, contributes to the research and development, such as a research institution. So if you're partnering with the University of Illinois, for example, and the University of Illinois gets hired as a subcontractor, that's the way that you would include them in the proposal. The subcontract has to have a budget just at the same level of detail as your budget. It's got to list their personnel, their travel, all of their costs, their indirect rates. So some subcontract budgets have to be equal to the main budget. Subcontractor will have to include a letter of a commitment as well. Alternatively, you can pay a vendor. And a vendor is a company or an individual, but usually a company that provides a standard established service with established rates. So if you hire the university to get one of their uh, faculty members and grad students to contribute intellectually to a project, that would be a subcontract. If you intend to hire the university to rent their pig farm and rent some pig materials, that wouldn't be the university serving as a subcontractor, that would be the university serving as a vendor because those services are known, you pay them a set fee, they're established, uh, there's no co intellectual contribution, they serve as a vendor. There's not a fine line between a subcontract and a vendor. There's a lot of overlap between the two of them. And so a lot of times you've got a judgment call to make. Do I use this institution as a subcontractor? Do I use them as a vendor? Now, if you use them as a vendor, they count as part of the two thirds of work that the company has to do. If you use them as a subcontractor, they count as part of the one third max that can be put outside. So Eric, in your case, if your outsourced work is generic enough that it's published, uh, you know, they've got standard prices for work that they do, like say that you spec out stuff and they just build stuff to spec, you might classify them as a vendor and then they would count in your two thirds. All right, get a lot of questions about these. Uh, so I'll stop now and see if there are any additional questions, uh, subcontracts or vendors, consultants. There are a bunch of questions in the chat, so I'm not sure what you saw, what you didn't see. Okay, and it turns out my chat is too small for me to comfortably read. That's so nice. if someone could uh, go ahead and you, sure. you may tell me what the questions are, that'd be great. You may have addressed this. Can employees be contract employees or would those be considered consultants? Uh, yes, good question, because it comes up a lot. The, the, they would be considered a consultant if they're a contract and not and if they're a 1099 contract or not a W-2 employee, they're a consultant and they would count at that one third max that the outsiders can do. I wanted to back up too, there was a question about audits. Do audits occur in phase one? I think it depends on the amount, but Roland also helps with audits for people. Roland. Yeah, and oh, I, I should mention as well that uh, I spend a lot of time, about half of my work is helping small business startups. Once they get an award, I, I help them manage all the finances, I do payroll. And so I help uh, run the award afterwards with the business management side of it. So I've got a lot of experience in this area as well. For phase one, you will undergo a financial review when you've been selected for an award. The way it works, and I'll go through this with the timeline, is that after you submit the proposal, you get notified that you're selected for an award. And at that point, you will have to submit evidence that you've got a good financial and timekeeping system in place and that you're strong enough to meet the requirements, the bookkeeping requirements of the company. They don't call it an audit, but it's sort of a quasi audit. It's a questionnaire. And you fill out a questionnaire and if you've got any written processes, you show them your written processes, you give them a bunch of paperwork, you demonstrate that you've got a good system in place. If they're satisfied with your res responses on the questionnaire, they don't ask any more questions and you're good to go. If they're not satisfied, they might ask some, some more questions. But at the phase one stage, you won't have somebody knocking on your door looking at your books in most cases. If they Here's suspect another. fraud, by the way, you could prompt an audit. So you have, want to do things that build confidence right off the beginning. Okay, other questions? Yes. Do you see companies hiring people just to fill their SBIR needs? And do people working on your SBIR team have to have been named in your proposal? The senior personnel should be named in the proposal. And I should mention this as well, the senior personnel do not have to be working for the company when you write the proposal. They can be working for another company. And then when you get the award, they can come onto your company. 
So the answer to the first question would be yes, people hire people just for the SBIR award. A lot of times they're doing other work until you get the SBI award. And at that point, they come on the company once you have the money. Roland, one thing that can be a little tricky with that is changing the PI midstream. Once you've been awarded, the PI is a more instrumental figure. So sometimes agencies frown upon changing. Can maybe speak to that a little bit more? They, yeah, thank you. They, they really do not like you to, to change the PI. When they go through the evaluation process, an important part of the evaluation process is the qualifications of the senior personnel. They look carefully at the bio sketches, they look carefully at those individuals. And if you get an award and then say, by the way, we're changing the individuals, essentially you're asking them to re-review the proposal. They don't like to have to do that. They don't have to, they don't like to look at the proposal and, and think again about whether everybody's qualified, whether the pay rates are appropriate, that's an extra burden on them. So it's not wise to set up a PI, especially the PI that you know is gonna change. If you change any senior personnel between proposal and award, you have to notify them and they have to look at the senior personnel and confirm that the senior personnel are okay as well. Uh, another question was, what about cloud computing costs? Where do they go in the budget? Cloud computing costs, the, the big factor there is whether the company buys cloud computing and use it for a lot of projects or whether a project needs a cloud computing resource specifically for that project. If you need the project, the cloud computing specifically for the project, then there is a category called other and you put that in the other category. It's line G6 on the NSF proposal and you describe the cloud computing and how you will use it for the project, why it's needed for the project, and you can charge it direct to the project. If the company just has cloud computing resources in general, and they're allocated to many different projects, and a lot of different projects use those resources, then they're part of GNA. And you just include them in the GNA pool, and whatever percentage you get as part of GNA, you, you in your bookkeeping, then apply the cloud computing to that percentage of GNA. That's a good question. Uh, Roland, two, two separate but related questions about PIs. So the first one is, can a PI for SBIR be a subcontractor or do they need to be an employee? And the second question is, is it possible for a PI to be a PI for more than one SBIR project? Uh, the, I'll, I'll answer them in reverse order. The second one, yes, a PI can be a PI for more than one project. You remember that a PI has to be working at least 51% for the company, but that 51% doesn't have to be on any one particular project. The PI can be the PI on several different projects, maybe uh, at 10% you know, on one project or 15% on another project. So you can be the PI on multiple projects, multiple SBIR projects. There are limits to the number of proposals of an individual can submit as a PI in any different cycle. So the, the limit that you really bump into is how many you can propose at any one time. And the agencies vary on that. But there really is no limit as to the number of SBIR proposals that you can be working on at any given time, except that you can't overcommit your time. You can't be working 20% on six proposals because then you'd be overcommitted and they will detect that and uh, you will not be allowed to do that. All right, the answer to the first question in most cases, the PI has to be an employee of the company. However, with an NIH STTR proposal, where you're partnering with a research institution, the PI can be still working for the research institution full-time and be a PI on an STTR. For SBIR, PI must be an employee of the company for STTR, in most agencies, PI must be an employee, but with NIH, not necessarily. All right, what else? I think that is it right now, so we will. Okay, great. Another uh, group that you might pay is a commercial consultant who is providing technical and business assistance. Increasingly, the SBIR budget funds not only technical research and development work, but also technical and business assistance, which is commercialization kind of work. Commercialization could include hiring a lawyer to help you with some intellectual property 
filings. It could include hiring a firm to help you do market research. It could include uh, you know, any, anything involving commercialization that's not technical research and development. Now, the NSF agencies will offer default services. If you don't request TABA in your proposal, you will still be able to use some of the services that the agencies provide. But if there's a vendor that you really like and want to include them in the proposal, you can include them as a direct expense of your proposal. It counts as part of the two thirds that you have to do and it's technical and business uh, expenses. NIH allows $6,500 for this. So does NS, uh, so do most of the other agencies. NSF has a Beat the Odds boot camp, which is either a 10 or a $20,000 effort, depending on whether it's SBIR or STTR. That's their default commercialization assistance. Other than the commercialization that's directly funded by the award, you cannot charge commercialization efforts to the direct SBIR project. They have to be part of GNA. All right, I'll cover a couple of points on budget justification. Oh, let's see. Um, no, I need to talk about materials and supplies. I almost forgot, it's not here, but materials and supplies are any, uh, any item that's $5,000 or less or less. That's the government guideline. So if you buy a computer, even though you might think of that as a piece of equipment and you spend a couple thousand dollars or maybe even $3,000 on, on a good computer, you charge that as materials and supplies. And so if you're building a piece of equipment and then you, you have to buy a lot of materials and supplies to build that piece of equipment. And building the equipment then, what you put in the budget is materials and supplies. The labor that's required to the build the equipment is part of the labor that you charge as part of your labor costs. So you don't charge for the equipment that you build, you charge direct to the project for the labor that it takes to do it, you charge direct to the project for the materials and supplies. Most, most SBIR proposals do not allow equipment in phase one. NIH does allow equipment in phase one, they realize that a lot of their work needs equipment so they allow it. You have to check with the agency to be sure. But uh, where you don't have equipment, you just hope that all the parts and supplies for what you wanna build come in at under $5,000. And if you really can't get around that, you can request a waiver. There are some ways of doing it. You explain why you need it. Usually the best solution though, uh, like if you say, let's say you're doing an NSF project and you need a, uh, some kind of a piece of equipment to measure tensile strength of, of metal because you're building a new metal. And that piece of equipment costs $100,000 as a test device. Well, NSF is not gonna pay the $100,000 for the test device, but they will pay you to rent the equipment. And so you can put equipment rental in your proposal rather than equipment purchase. So usually if you need equipment that costs more than $5,000, you just rent it and put the rental costs in the proposal. In addition to the proposal itself, you need a budget justification. Uh, the personnel, you have to describe what they're doing. You have to describe their time and their commitment. You don't describe their bio here. A lot of people tend to overdo this session. They say, this person has a lot of experience and this is why they're so good for the position. Don't do that in the budget justification. You've got a bio sketch and you've got a company section of the proposal. You've got other places to do that. Uh, for senior personnel, as I said, you can put the name and the title for other personnel. To be determined is okay as long as you describe the title. It's also include, uh, good to include the SOC code from the Bureau of Labor Statistics website. Oh, and by the way, when you get the PDF of uh, this proposal, all these links will be active. So uh, I've got lots of links built in here. When you get the PDF file, uh, you can click on the links and see it. The BLS website gives you special op 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 occupation codes for various different occupations, and it's good to put the SOC code in. With NSF, or nobody requires the SOC code in the phase one proposal. But with NSF, if you get selected for an award and they come back and want during the financial review, they will say, your proposal is an error because you didn't produce the SOC codes. You must now rectify this terrible error. They sound nasty about it. In fact, they've never asked for it before, but you could head them off at the pass and go ahead and put the SOC codes in at the proposal stage. For travel, you need a pretty fine breakdown except for the NSF grantee workshop. The NSF allow you to just say, we're gonna put $2,000 in for a grantee workshop and they're okay with that. But other than that, you have to list 
the number of days of the trip, the number of people, lodging costs, all the details, the purpose of the trip, who's going on it and why you need it. Also as a point, if you're going to a conference, conference registration, you include as part of a travel cost. You don't usually think of that as a travel cost, but in your travel budgets, you can include the, uh, the conference registration. Also in your budget justification, materials and supplies, list them all individually. A table is really nice. Number of units, total. Uh, if you have larger amounts for materials and supplies, big price quotes, you can include, uh, uh, you'll want to include a price quote from the vendor. Subcontractors and consultants will need to have a letter of, of commitment. This is in some cases attached to the budget justification. In other cases, it's attached to an other document section. You have to check with your agency and find out which it is. Any vendors, you have to have a price quote. You don't necessarily need a letter from them. TABA, you need an information about the, uh, the vendor, what they're gonna do, a statement of work, who they are, and they will need to supply a letter of commitment the same as a consultant will. All right, in just a minute, I'm going to pause again for questions, but while you're formulating the next round of questions, let me look at, let me show you a hypothetical budget. This is for NIH, but this is what a budget might look like on an NIH form. And you see everything that we talked about here. You see a, a base salary for each uh, employee. These are senior personnel. Now, senior personnel for the company will work calendar months. Academic and summer months are for academic employees. So you'll see academic and summer months usually on a subcontract to a university, but you don't usually see that on the main proposal. So there's a question amount, you've got a fringe benefit rate. We've chosen a fin fringe benefit rate, uh, rate of 25% in this example. You end up with a requested amount for each of the three main faculty members. And then we've got some other direct individuals here. We haven't named them in the proposal. They're a single line in the proposal budget, but they're multiple lines and multiple descriptions in your budget justification. You total their time you total their uh, salary, you total all of them, and then you add the other personnel total here to the main personnel total and you come up with a total senior and other personnel. I should also mention that a business will not have any students. If they're working, even if they're a student, if they're working for the business, they're an employee or a consultant for the business. If you're a research institution, you will have students working for you and you can hire students, but businesses don't hire students. Usually you don't see secretary and clerical in a business either because that's part of your general and administrative expenses. It's very rare that secretarial and clerical assistance would be needed just for a specific project. Okay, uh, no equipment as you can see here. And uh, we've got a little bit of travel. The budget justification will have that travel outline. And the people who wrote this example have been to my seminar. They know not to produce any equipment and training costs, so they don't have any equipment and training costs. Other direct costs, they've got a modest amount of uh, materials and supplies. We've got a consultant of $6,000 here. Uh, we've got a subcontractor of $42,000. We chose to rent equipment rather than to buy it. And uh, here's, here's the equipment rental here. We've got the rental costs here and here. And then we've got a total amount of other direct costs. That comes up to a total direct and other direct of $176,138. Now, with NIH, in your indirect cost base, the amount that you apply the indirect rate to, you can include only 25% or only the first $25,000 of subcontract costs. And so the indirect cost base here is a little less than the total direct costs because the amount of consortium and consultant costs over 25,000 is not included in the base. So you apply the 40% to the base, you come up with funds requested, you come up with a total, oops, a total indirect cost amount there. That is added to all the other top costs and you come up with a total requested amount and on top of that, you've got your 7% fee. Now, this totals $256,000, but the 
the NSF or the NIH interface doesn't calculate that for you. I wish they would. It seems like it's something that they ought to, but they don't. So you have to calculate it yourself and make sure that these two numbers don't total more than your 256,000 for NIH, $256,580 maximum. All right, I'm going to pause now and see if there are any further questions. So Laura, either of you, if you see any other questions, please we have let me one. Know. Okay, great. Uh, do companies include a line item for spending related to advertising of new products? Okay, no. Advertising and, and new products is commercialization work and not technical work. If you have hired an individual as a TABA consultant to do marketing for you, then you can include the marketing costs as part of the TABA work. But other than the specifically funded TABA work, that kind of advertising is not included in your direct budget. Uh, another question is, can you classify rent to own costs for equipment as rental costs? Or is Yes, you can. I have, I have seen that. I have seen that. You can do that. And a lot of times that's a way to sort of get around, if you will, uh, not being able to purchase equipment. A rent to own agreement is, is rent. That's a good question. It does, that, that does come up from time to time. That's all I see. If anybody wants to come off of mute and ask a question verbally, you're more than welcome to. All right, I'll wait just for a little bit to see if there are any others before going ahead to the next section. And Roland, I don't know if that's something we should be thinking about at the incubator of the rent to own. It may be possible for those of you in enterprise works that we could work out some kind of an arrangement to purchase and add it back to rent on a monthly basis. Just trying to think of how to address that need. Yeah. Have you encountered that? Have you had clients come to you and ask, you know, we, I mean, we've done some creative work on equipment. So just if you're one of our enterprise works companies, just know, talk to us about it. If there's a way we can do something, especially shared, somewhat shared equipment, things that might have one or more companies, more than one company that might use it. We often will buy and then um, sometimes we'll share cost in some way, but we can help facilitate. Okay, great, great. So Roland, there's a question about legal costs. I think you mentioned this a bit, but um, are patent costs or trademarks included in the, are not included in the budget or what is the status of things like that? It would be essentially the same as uh, with the, um, uh, advertising question. Unless it's specifically funded as part of that TABA work, you cannot include it in your uh, SBIR proposal. Something to note on these as well, I'm hopeful, don't have the answers yet, that when the Illinois matching awards come through, that these are the type of expenses that will be eligible. That has been common in other states that the state matching awards, if you're in another state, you might check, might be able to cover some of these not allowable, essentially, expenses in your SBIR award. Yeah, that'd be nice if we can get that, wouldn't it? That would be really helpful. The, uh, the government does have a list of uh, expenses that you cannot include as part of your GNA pool. They call them unallowable expenses. And patent costs is one of those. If you incur patent costs, you have to fund them out of your 7% fee or other funding, other investment funding. You can't fund them directly out of the SBIR proposal. Roland, can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, yeah, Hi. go ahead. Hi, this is Eugene. Hi, we've met before. Oh, hey. yeah. So, so if you put a budget in the application and can, 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 can NSF or NIA just reject certain lines within the budget but approve the project or would they just completely, you know, let's say you have a TABA and that was not justified well, but the rest of it was fine. Can they just reject the TABA part but not, not, not the rest? Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up. That's an important point. Um, if, if there's a line in your budget that they don't like, that won't kill the proposal. If they like the proposal, but have an issue with some part of it, they will negotiate with you during the selection time, during the administrative review. They might say, okay, you know, this TABA is not justified. You can't include it. Uh, so you can't use that TABA vendor. Usually they will let you reallocate the funds though. 
before an award. And NSF certainly does. They say, hey, you know, we don't like your TABA vendor. You can't use them. They're not qualified. So take your, take your money and do something else with it. Or, you know, we don't like this individual or we think your indirect rates are inappropriate. We won't allow them, but they'll let you reallocate so that you can reapply or modify the budget and still get to the 256,000 total. They're, they tend to be flexible if they like the project, but don't like one aspect of the budget. If okay. the budget's totally out of line and isn't really appropriate for the project, that'll kill the proposal. Yes. But if the budget is generally reasonable and appropriate, but they have an issue with one line, that won't kill the proposal. They'll work with you. I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, just there's a lot of caveats with this. Everything has a lot of caveats. I mean, and th this is, you know, just, just. Uh, yeah. And, you know, the overall thing is the program manager will talk to you. If they like the project, they'll figure out a way to make it work. If they don't like the project and they don't like the concept, they don't like the way you've, you've gone about it, they won't even bother working with you. Anything else for now? Okay, proposal development timeline. <clears throat> you need to start a good, you know, three months ahead of time, 10 weeks or so. And so you should be thinking now towards the end of August. If you're starting a proposal now, a good comfortable time frame is, is would be the end of August. Now this really depends on how much you have in place already. If you are well along, you've got the project well-defined, you know the marketplace and you've done some homework and legwork with customer discovery and can talk about the customers, you're a little further along. If you've got all your registrations in place, you're a little further along. But if you're starting from scratch or pretty much from scratch, you need to start now for like end of August. You know, review the programs and the guides. They change each year, they change by agency. And at this stage, there are some scaffolding documents that you can produce, a summary case that just may, outlines the main reasons for funding outside the proposal guidelines, the proposal requirements, just jot down, why should this succeed? Why would somebody buy it? Why should we get funding? And then your proposal effort will be substantiating those main points and you figure out how to make that flow into the requirements. But coming with an initial draft case statement is a good way to start and guide the process. Also, it's a good time to be contacting the program officer and how to contact the program officer is a nice topic for another day. Uh, a good couple months ahead of time, identify your partners and let them know that you're gonna ask for letters of request. If they're a partnering research institution, they will know that they will need a letter of commitment. If they're a consultant, you'll need to let them know you'll need a letter of commitment. If they're a letter of support writer, you'll need to let them know you're gonna be asking for a letter of support and you can start negotiating what can go into a letter of support. A good six weeks ahead of time or even longer, you need to do registrations if you haven't done that yet. Your company has to be registered, your company has to have a DUNS number, or your company has to exist as a company. So it's got to have a taxpayer ID number and an IRS registration. It's got to have a SAM number. It has to have a DUNS number. You have to register with the agency uh, login database. You've got to register with NSF, you've got to register in Fastlane. With NIH, you have to register in ERA Commons. Uh, you know, with the DOD, you have to do FedConnect. Each agency has its own uh, uh, website you have to register with. And they can take a month to do this. It's not an exaggeration, just turnaround time. It can take a month for all these registrations. And I've seen more than one proposal get hung up at the end because they haven't done the registrations and it's a week to go and they, they just can't submit. So you don't want this to screw you up at the hectic time towards the end of registration or at the end of proposal development, a good month ahead of time, you should have an initial draft of the proposal. This is most of the text, it can still have holes, it can have some bullets here and there, some places where you need to flush out areas, places you're uncertain, but pretty much the document should be ready to flow and in place a good month ahead of time. This allows for maturity, for debate, for changing things that, are, that need to be changed at this point, for finding in gaps that you haven't seen before because you're so close to it. A good two weeks ahead of time, you should have a complete draft done. Pretty much everything in place, maybe a few little details here and there, but should be ready to go. And plan on submitting a good week ahead of time. This might seem like overkill, but if you plan a week ahead of time, how often do you actually make the week ahead of time? You still need a few days and you need some days to submit and recover because inevitably something goes wrong with the process. And the closer you get to the deadline, the more likely things are to go wrong with the problem 
but with the process. And the more likely things are to go wrong that you ne never would have dreamed of. Your power goes out, the computer goes down, somebody gets sick. Uh, you know, one guy was, I know, had a, was submitting it the last four hours before I had a time, and he reached to get a piece of paper out of the garbage and had a paper cut. And so he had to type like four hours ahead of the proposal deadline with only one hand because he had a paper cut. You know, stuff will go wrong. So you submit ahead of time, and then that gives you a week before the deadline to help your colleagues who are frantic because they have not seen the guidelines. They are still rushing around trying to get it. And then after you've tried to get the proposal in, then after you've submitted, you wait, and you wait, and you wait. And about three months later, sometimes four months later, you get that administrative review that I talked about. If you're selected, they say you've been selected for an award, you have to submit some financial documents. With NSF, it's two rounds of documents. They ask you for all this stuff, and then they come back and say, okay, now you need to submit another round of financial documents. And you go, didn't I submit that already? And they say, yes, you did, but now another group needs it. So you have to submit it twice. And then maybe four months or sometimes five or six months afterwards, you get an award notification, or if you haven't been selected, you get a rejection and you get a debrief. Now, if you get a rejection, all is not lost. Many times a successful process is a two submission process. You look over the rejections, you understand what the reviewers didn't like, you address those the next time around and you resubmit. So at the beginning, be prepared for multiple submissions. This is not uncommon. And a lot of companies get funded only after the second submission. If in fact, they don't like your idea and you realize, well, they just don't like the concept. This is not gonna go anywhere. You say, okay, we gave it a good shot, but your time is not lost because the process of developing the proposal is a great exercise. It's a great exercise in clarifying the project in gathering information, in understanding really what you're all about, in being able to explain what you're about to other people. So it's a good process to go through, even if you don't get funded, it's not wasted. So this is kind of what the timeline looks like. I'm gonna go ahead and run through formatting and graphics real quick. And then we'll have a few minutes left for questions. The main thing you wanna do is keep your audience in mind. These are hurried people. They're on the airplane at the last minute flying to the review session, or they're reading at the last minute at home if, they, if they're not traveling. They, they have limited amount of time. They've got thick proposals to read, a ream worth of paper to read. You have to have something that's at a glance. You can do this many, many different ways. Bolding main points, uh, you know, bringing things to the fore. Bullet lists are very good. You have to be able to look at a glance and say, okay, I get this. This is important. This is a game changer. I can see where people have to have it. Another way to do that is to embed key points into subheaders. You have to use the headers that are prescribed in the guidelines, but the subheaders you can do with what you want. So don't have a subheader that says summary or background. That, that wastes valuable space. That subheader space is very valuable. And if you just say summary in a subheader, you're communicating the information a summary will follow, which does not say anything about your proposal. Instead, you want to put some context, a summary into those subheaders, like proposed technology can reduce infant deaths by 6%. six percent. That's big font. It's a big header. This is a good use of space. And I've got another example here where you want to bring things into the header. So make the main points pop out so reviewers can just look at it and very quickly get it. Graphics, very important. You can use graphics profitably if they're good graphics. If they're good, they're compelling, they're easy to understand. And you have to, in three seconds, under, uh, convey what you're talking about, the value impact of it, what it's like to use the product, what's the key technology innovation here. And I'll give you a couple of real quick examples here of um, a, a, a graphic that's very similar. Here's a graphic that's very similar to the kind that I see. This is not a real graphic, but it's a ginned up graphic based on a lot of other ones that I've seen. And if you have this as your main graphic up front, mostly you're communicating, what is this? And a reviewer will look at this and say, this is kind of, this pr project maybe has something to do with Petri dishes, or you know maybe it has something to do with sunspots from planetary can uh, planets with suns at different spots. You know, maybe this is retinal scans of eyeballs. You know, who knows what this is? This is a, 
A blobby graphic doesn't tell you anything. An example of a better graphic would be this one, which, which demonstrates the same thing. This concept here is it is a, uh, an, an infrared uh, gene splicing technique in which you gene splice a plant so that they, the, the gene then gives off an IR marker and a drone flies overhead. It reads the IR marker. It receives a stress signal. If a plant is poor water or other stress, it sends that to a data system. A farmer receives the information and decides what to do about it. And then you've got the benefits down here. So this is an example of a better graphic. I'm still not satisfied with this graphic, but you get the idea of, um, of what you want in a good graphic. Main points again, value advantage, impact, user experience, technology innovation. And the main point here is these graphics take a lot of time to come up with. It takes a lot of time to think about it. A very good graphic hides the expertise that it took to develop it. A very good graphic, someone looks at it and says, oh yeah, I get it. This is simple. I, I get the concept. Why would this take time to describe? But the amount of time it takes to come up with that simple graphic is a lot. It can be a lot. And you want to test your graphics just like everything else. Show your graphic around to other people who aren't familiar with the proposal. See if they understand it. Okay, I think we have, what, about one minute left to see if there are any questions. I got it all in, answered some questions. I am available afterwards. Uh, you can request my assistance. And so I'll pass it off to Laura to go ahead and mention about how to request the assistance. So two things, and I know you asked probably the other Laura, I'll mention we do have shared services, which is available to incubator clients. They probably are not gonna come up with all the thinking around the graphic that Roland just described, but if you needed a graphic designer to help make that actualized as something that is professional, look at our shared services program. There are some ways you can qualify if you're in other locations across the state as well. And then secondly, I just wanna put a reminder, next Wednesday is our fourth session of this sprint. So please join us, same time, same place. And um, I'll put that information in the chat. Laura, do you wanna follow up on requesting time one-on-one? -on -one? And I know we have a special guest with us today, Shelly Maves, who is another person that we have started working with. So I'll say in advance, you're gonna hear Shelly's name going forward, but I'm giving her the week off until we're ready to, to formalize that introduction. Sure, so we've mentioned it in the chat, but if you are not aware, we do have, uh, you can find our resources related to getting one-on-one uh, -on -one assistance. We do have you fill out a short request form uh, so that we can evaluate that and match uh, folks appropriately with our various different experts that we have. Um, and that is found on the Research Park website. I posted it in the chat, but if you uh, look at researchpark.illinois.edu, you should be able to find it. And if you can't find it, just let us know. So we are here and happy to help. We provide lots of different resources and have uh, experts who've worked with companies at every stage. So whether it's for preparing for phase one, figuring out SBIR readiness for your company, or if you already have received an SBIR and are looking to phase one and are looking to the phase two process, we welcome all of those uh, questions and hope that we can help support you in that journey. Uh, so thank you all for being here. As Laura mentioned, we'll be here again next Wednesday and we will be posting more information about, uh, about uh, further workshops that will be happening this summer soon. So thank you so much, Roland. And uh, we'll be seeing many of you in the future, I hope. All right, see y'all next care, week. Everyone.